the story is very dramatic. The story of the protocols is probably, not that I say so, but many say so, is probably one of the most dramatic occurrences in the 20th century. But I cannot speak of uh, different subjects without telling a little of the story, but only a little because I want you to read my book. So I won't tell you the whole story, which is really very dramatic. I must begin by, with myself why I came to write this book. I was a judge for 31 years. But during this time, I did various missions for the state of Israel. I twice was a member of Israel's delegation to the United Nations Assembly. I, I was on Hasbara missions around the world. And uh, I was always on loan. I was lent by the uh, judiciary and came back to the court every time. 31 years I ser served in the court. But during that time, when I was on missions, including twice at the United Nations, I encountered the protocols. I must tell you, I grew up in Israel, and we never, in history lessons, we never talked about the protocols. Nobody mentioned the protocols. I knew about something that I was told that it's some kind of forgery, forget it, it's a joke, it's nothing. But when I was at the United Nations and also at UNESCO in Paris conference, they mentioned the protocols. And when I was at the United Nations, I was told that every time that I was representing Israel, I was told that every time that they attack Israel, at the end of the meeting, I have the right of response. <coughs> so there were many delegates from nations that never, ever used the right of response because they were never attacked. But Israel was attacked every day. So every day I have to, had to use, at the end of the meeting, the right of response. So I answered, but some friends on the committee came to ask me, why don't you ever respond when they mention the protocols of the elders of Zion? I said, because this is a joke. I cannot treat it seriously. And they told me, including people from Brazil, they told me, you are joking. In our country, it is bestsellers. It is distributed everywhere. And many people told me so. So I was very surprised. And I said, well, I must read these protocols. I had my, my, the first chapter of my book is called Encounters with the Protocols. And I tell a story of many countries where I encountered the protocols. But it took me 20 years to finally decide I must read them. And then I discovered <coughs> a very strange thing. The protocols were translated into every count in language in the world, but every language in the world, except Hebrew. They were never translated into Hebrew. The Jewish people didn't need it. Why? Okay, so the Goim says it was translated into every other language. Also Yiddish, but not Hebrew. So, I took it from the university library in English. Actually, my English is uh, like a mother tongue. Not, it is not in my mother tongue, but it is like. And the book, actually, I wrote in English first, because I thought, who in Israel would be interested? That's another story. Anyway, when I read the protocols, I had a sleepless night. Has anybody here read the protocols? The protocols itself. Not the whole thing, but. Usually in an audience, there is not one person who has read the protocols. Because who needs the protocols? But when I read it, I was so flabbergasted, if one can use such a word, flabbergasted. And 
I had sleepless nights. And I felt I had to do something about it, but what do you do? And that's a long story how I came by, by chance, by chance, really by chance, to hear about the Berm trial, which, of which I will tell you later, and where I was invited to a speech on a different subject in Bern, Switzerland. That is when I met persons who knew about this trial, and that is when my journey with the protocols began. It was really a journey with the protocols. And I felt in my bones that I had to do something about it because it so appears that the truth about the protocols, the real truth, was told in some books. Not in many languages, but there are some books. But all the existing books that were written were academic with a lot of footnotes. Somebody got a grant at a university and had some assistance, and they wrote a book, but who reads books with a lot of footnotes? Who takes them on an airplane? So I decided that I must write a book for the general readership, for the general public, no footnotes, just tell the story. And it burned in my bones that I have to do it quickly. So everybody thought I was crazy when I decided to retire from, my, from the court five years before my compulsory retirement age to, to research and write this book. They thought I was crazy. I was at Supreme Court already and I, they said, how are you doing this? They told me the protocols have waited so long, they can wait another few years. I said, no, they can wait, but I can't. If I don't do it now, I will not do it. I had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea that it will take me six years to research, and I was, it, it was a solo project. I had no academia behind me. I had no assistants, no secretaries, nothing. All alone with my laptop, went to different countries. I didn't even know how to look at archives. Everything alone, except one assistant, who was a Russian professor in Israel, and he helped me with the Russian archives because I don't speak Russian. So the only one who helped me with Russian and went with me to Russia was <laughs> Professor Boris Morozov. Otherwise, I don't believe sometimes that I undertook such a project all alone traveling around the world. When they interviewed me at the Times of London, and they told me, they asked me how I wrote it, and I said, it's, it's like a detective story, really. And I told him, I took a laptop and I went around the world. So he said, you remind me of a modern Miss Marple. <laughs> anyway, this is how it started.